Hello, Oxygen. Today, I am sitting with some of the strongest, kindest, courageous, and most compassionate women at Champion Center. And I am so excited about the conversation that we're about to dive into. But before we go any further, I think it's important that you know who we're talking to today. So ladies, welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. Why don't we start with Sarah? Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. Hey, y'all. My name is Sarah. I have been a part of Champion Center since I was about eight or nine years old. I'm a mom of three, a wife of about 20 years, almost 20 years, and I have my own private practice as a licensed mental health counselor, and I'm excited to be with all of you tonight. I'm Veronica. I was not raised in the church, but by the grace of God, someone invited me 10 years ago, and I'm here. My name is Gina Anderson, and it's still fun to say my last name because I'm newly married, and so just a little over a year I've been married, and um, I grew up in Montana, came out here for school, but originally a pastor's daughter, and uh, been at Champion Center for about six years now, and have loved every minute of it. Hi, my name is Renata. I am a single mom of a 19-year-old daughter, Jasmine. I've been attending Champion Center for about five, six years now, and I'm just honored to be a part of this panel. Well, thank you, ladies, so much for being here. I know each and every one of you um, bring something so unique and special to the table. So I'm excited um, to dive into our conversation. And today we're going to be centering our, our time together about what it means to be a woman of grit and grace according to women in the Bible. So we're going to be looking to the Bible about examples of womanhood and what God says about the strength of a woman. Because let's face it, women, we are awesome. We're incredible. You are incredible. And so I'm going to go ahead and get us started with Sarah. Sarah, who is someone in the Bible that you just really resonate with? Yeah, I chose to talk about Sarah, not <laughs> not just because she has an amazing name, mm -hmm. but I feel like she is pretty gritty and graceful. This woman had a baby at 90 years old, oh. y'all. I'm pretty sure she was well into menopause, so I'm not so sure about that. But she also had a disbelief in what God was asking her to do. So much disbelief that she laughed at God and, and actually decided to take matters into her own hands, offering her servant to her husband so that he could have a child. She felt unqualified. She felt unfit. And I can relate to that. I, I, that's something that I, I have to wrestle with day in and day out, feeling unqualified as a mama, mm -hmm. feeling unqualified as a wife. And I think what's loudest in my head is feeling unqualified in my profession. Wow. As I mentioned in my intro, I'm a licensed mental health counselor. And God tries to shut down those insecurities daily. And he's done some things in my life to show me that I don't get the final say, that he gets the final say. In the last year alone, I've been invited to sit on panels with experts in the field of mental health and, and the Christian community. A couple years ago, I was asked to be the national director of Celebrate Recovery. That's over 35,000 locations that he's tapped me and said, you're it. I only have a master's, master's degree, and there's far more educated people in my circle, more highly decorated, more wise people. And I question him. I question why. But I made an agreement with God that if he asked me, I would say yes. And this wow. has not been easy. Wow. I still beg and I plead and I tell him no. I, I say yes when I get the service plan saying you're going to be on, on planning center. Every single time I'm shaking in my boots, but I'm thinking a lot like Sarah. And she's saying to God, God, look at my 90-year-old body. How am I going to have this baby? But God, biology, God is not limited by biology, right? And so I'm learning that he is who qualifies me. It's not my degrees. It's not the letters after my name that I may question him or think that he's making a mistake, but I will continue to trust him and I will continue to say yes. Sarah, a lot like me, carried fears and doubts, but God still chose her, chose her to be the mother of nations, chose her to have this lineage, this royal lineage. Our savior of the world came from Sarah's lineage. Wow. 
you know, I believe it was because of her eventual faith that gave her the strength to have her baby. Um, And I think that Sarah's story shows us that no matter who we are, Sarah actually came from a pagan background. No matter who we are, no matter where we came from, that our faith and God's power we will be able to fulfill. We will, we will, excuse me, we will be able to walk in the purpose yes. Yes. and the promises that God has for us. And that's, that's so encouraging to me as I walk through these feelings of doubt and, and insecurities. Oh, that's so good. I mean, let's talk about grit of a 90-year-old woman have that, having a baby. That is gritty. That is gritty. And what I think is so beautiful about that story is it demonstrates that age is not a disqualifier for God. Right. Because you look all throughout the Bible and God used people on both sides of the pendulum of age. Yeah. You know, so often we can say, oh God, well, I'm I'm too young or I'm too old. But that doesn't matter to God. You know, we even look at Mary, the the mother of Jesus. She was, the Bible says she was a teenager when an angel visited her and said, hey, look here, Mary, you're going to birth the savior of the world. And what I'm amazed by her response, I was actually just reading her story the other day. This is how she responds in Luke 137. She said, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the fact that she had the grit to accept God's plan for her own life. And that takes courage. That takes strength. So age is not a disqualifier for Jesus. Amen to that. (laughs) Renata, you told me that there was a woman in the Bible that you connected well with. And I would love to hear from you who that is. Yeah. So the woman that I can relate to that resonates with me is the woman with the issue of blood. Mm. You know, and I think about how she crawled to Jesus' feet. And she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, you know, I know I will be healed. I know I will be made whole. And I don't know about you guys, but so many times in my life, I've been so desperate for Jesus. I've been desperate for healing. I've been desperate for, you know, family and, and relationships to just come to Christ. I've been desperate you know, I, I, I was a single mom. I am a single mom, you know, but I was a teenage single mom. And, you know, being a teenage mom alone have its ups and its downs, you know. And for me, being a teenage mom, but also being in the church at the time, I let that stop me from serving God. You know, the, the guilt and the shame of becoming pregnant in the church was just overwhelming for me and I I listened to the enemy's voices when he said you should be ashamed of yourself how can you do that but at the end of the day my daughter is beautiful my daughter is not the sin you know I I practice sin but my daughter is a blessing from God you know so every time the enemy tell me oh you know you messed up too bad God would never forgive you you know I'm reminded that I can crawl to Jesus' feet and just touch the hem of his garment. And I know from, from, from the, the woman with the issue of blood, she didn't care about what people thought of her. You know, she didn't care. She was like, I got to get there. And she literally crawled. So that's grit and that's grace, you know. And I just feel that we have to say, okay, no matter what's going on, no matter what we're facing, we have to seek Jesus' face. And I, I'm just reminded because I lost my mom five days ago, literally, you know, and the heartbreak is still there. But I was listening to Pastor Jody's word, and she said, peace and pain can coexist. Amen. So we have to remember, even though I'm heartbroken, I didn't know if I was going to be able to sit here with you beautiful ladies, but I'm just like, my mom would want me to do that. That's grit and that's grace. I'm going to keep moving forward. You know, my mom is the one that told me all about Jesus. So I can't stop now. Like I'm moving forward, you know, like I, I, I have to do this, not just for me, but for my mom, you know, so I'm. I'm just like the lady with the issue of blood. You know, I've had some health scares. You know, I've had some some trying times in my life, you know, but but God. So she 
it's like the person that I'm just like, okay, I'm her. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times I can just lay prostrate and just call out Jesus when I don't have the words to say. You know, I just keep her in the back of my mind. If she can do it, Nada, you can do it. So, yeah, I... That's beautiful, Renata. Thank you for sharing that. And I know when we were talking about this woman in the Bible, it's so interesting because we know her not by her name, but the woman with the issue of blood. And I think sometimes when we go through life's hardships, maybe the world can label us by our issues but we serve a God who is a chain breaker, a stronghold breaker. And when he looks at us, he doesn't see our past. Mm -hmm. He doesn't see our sin, but he sees us as a daughter of the most high God and that we are qualified Mm -hmm. and that we are called because of who Jesus is and the sacrifices that he made. And so I'm so thankful for your story because your story in itself, Renata, is a story in the making of God's grace and God's redemption and how he can take hard things but turn it around for the good for those that love him. And that is biblical. Read it in your word. Uh, Veronica, when we were talking, I feel like the story that you were drawn towards had a similar spirit to Renata's. It was another woman in the Bible who was desperate. She was desperate and in in a time of need. And I I loved hearing what you had to say about that. Yeah. So the lady that really resonated with me was um, the sinful lady with the alabaster perfume. Um, Just for some context for anybody who doesn't know the story uh she's this lady who's in a room with jesus and pharisees and the pharisees are looking at her talking about her judging her and she still had this grit and courage to go to the feet of jesus and be forgiven and i think about that when she's there you know with this perfume that probably cost like a year's worth of wages and her tears. And I don't have a year's worth of wages of perfume, but I do have tears that I've shed at the feet of Jesus. And I was that sinful lady. I was the sinful lady who had so much mess. And I didn't know if I was able to go to the feet of Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Like when I say I have a laundry list of sin, I have it. You think of it, I did it. I was um, molested at a young age. Um, I had, I was promiscuous, children out of wedlock, Uh, met my husband and he was married and I still continued to have that relationship. But by the grace of God, you know, I found out that I, even through that sin, through that mess, that I can lay at the feet of Jesus and tears in my eyes and ask for forgiveness and of what I've did and and the great thing about it is that it just didn't end there it didn't end with me just having the courage to lay at his feet but God has did a miraculous thing in my life I am no longer that person who hides that guilt and shame and is like you know I could be that person but I'm not because of Jesus I'm, my life is totally different. I'm in a wonderful, amazing church. I have a marriage of 10 years to my amazing husband. I have five children. Yes, that is right. Five children. And they love Jesus. And I never would have imagined that I would be wor- working at the church. Never would that have ever have crossed my mind. And I think one thing I would encourage other women is that if you're living in that sinful life and you feel like it's too messy to lay it at his feet, it's not. Like, you still have time. You can give it to Jesus and lay it at his feet with those tears in your eyes, and he's going to forgive you. And that's the great thing about Jesus and what he's did for me. Yeah. What, what I hear you saying, Veronica, is having the grit to come to Jesus, even in our brokenness. Even in our mess, you know, you you hear that saying that we don't get good and then get God. We get God, and because we get God, then we get good. And that that's available for us today. But it takes guts. I know when I've been in seasons where I feel like maybe I'm not hitting the mark, Mm -hmm. I've found myself internally maybe going, okay, God, like, Mm -hmm. I love you. Okay, bye. Like, honestly, just being transparent 
distancing myself because of the shame and because of the condemnation when Jesus is like, no, I want to love you in the mess. I want, I want to love you through it. But it takes courage. Yeah, and I've had to remind myself even about that now, like even times where I feel yes. like, you know, if I mess up as a mom right. I, or I get it wrong, I'm like, no, yep. like it's okay. Like yep. Jesus still loves me. Mm-hmm. He still chose me. I, I'm still their mom and I'm mm-hmm. still the one that is going to love them through it. And it and God's going to see me through it no matter what. I'm so glad you said that because sometimes I think it's a daily battle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is not a one and done. All right, I'm good for life. Let's right. take this thing on no you know the bible talks about the renewing of our mind daily and to remind ourselves. okay yep this is maybe my past but lord this is where you're taking me in my future and that's hard work that takes grit Mm, that's beautiful yeah i was gonna say uh the the woman that i chose um was ruth Mm -hmm. and uh what i love about uh ruth is she had to choose to do the hard thing and uh, Ruth lost her husband, uh, her sister-in-law. Also, they were brothers. They both passed away. And Naomi, the mother, was saying, go, go back home. And Ruth said, no, I, I feel called to you. I feel called to stay. And um, I mean, even personally, I grew up in small town Montana, mm-hmm. came out here for school, um, and it would have been easy to go back home. It would have been easy to gravitate back towards what was comfortable, but I knew that God was calling me to the hard thing. And uh, I just, I look at the life of Ruth and that she was so confident in what God had called her to do that she stepped into that hard thing. And I think one thing I've learned just through all seasons of life is that when we provide the grit, God provides the grace. And so we have to show up. We have to, my mom puts it this way, take the next step. Just do the next thing. And so when we provide that grit, God always provides the grace. And I'm kind of a nerd. And so I I went and looked up some of the words that we're talking about. But um, the first one is grace. And uh, I realized that grace is both a noun, but it's also a verb. So grace is a noun really is this like unmerited gift that allows us to be sanctified. It's what washes away the sin. But then you have grace as a verb. And so that grace is, is God adorning us um, almost with strength and adorning us with this spiritual authority to be able to take on those things in our lives. And so it's a both and we're receiving this grace, but then we're also graced to face the things that we come in contact with. And I think that's what leads to grit, um, which I've really found to be just this like parallel of resilience. Um, and I think about like glass If glass gets hit, it's going to shatter. But resilient would be something that gets hit, and it might, you know, concave a little bit. But then once it's not, like, once it comes out, it goes back to its original form. It bounces back, um, which made me immediately think of uh, Jairus' daughter when she passed away. And Jesus walked in and said, um, Talitha kum, rise, little girl. Get up, little girl. And I look at that situation where she got hit, right? Like she actually was dead. And Jesus could have walked in and said, be healed, little girl, but just rest. Just lay there and, and, and come back slowly. But he didn't. He walked up and he said, rise up, little girl. Like, get up. You're healed. Um, and I think in the same way, like being gritty doesn't mean we're not going to take the hit. Mm-hmm. But it means when we take the hit, we bounce back. Uh, I love what PK has been saying about original intent, mm-hmm. right? Like God called us to something that was our original intent. So when we take those hits, we bounce back to what God originally had called us to. Gina, I love what you just said there, that when we provide the grit, that God provides the grace. And I know in your own life, you know, you shared earlier that you grew up in ministry, you're a pastor's kid, and it'd be really easy to think, oh, grew up in church, life has been easy. But I know that's not true, that you have some grit and grace stories of your own. Could you share any of those with us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do. I think a lot of people look at my life and think, oh, it's been easy and and all this stuff. But a lot of people don't realize um, I've had two open heart surgeries. And so I was born with a heart defect. Um, and they didn't catch it till I was five. And then from the age five to the age nine, they just kind of monitored it. It was okay. I couldn't do high cardio 
cardio things, but for the most part, I was okay. Um, and at nine years old, they determined that it had been uh, kind of considered life-threatening. And so they decided I needed open heart surgery. And being a, a pastoral household, I remember, uh, you know, we would have worship nights at the church and my parents would gather all the people around me and they would lay hands on me and, and we'd pray and, and we would believe, you know, and we'd have faith. And so going into that first open heart surgery, we had to fly to Salt Lake. And I remember um, walking into that pre-op appointment and my parents and I were like, that we're going to get in there and they're not going to find anything and I'm not going to have to have this surgery because God's going to heal me. Um, and so when the doctor walked in the room and looked at us and said, okay, like we got all the results back. We're going to prep you for surgery and head on in. It was kind of like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Like it's not supposed to be there. You know, like I'm not supposed to have to actually have the surgery. I'm supposed to be healed. Um, and I, at that point, at that age, at nine years old, I don't think I really understood what was going on, but I just remember the, like, disappointment in my parents' faces of, of why God, you know? Um, and so we made it through that, and I recovered, and then five years later, it was back. And it was like, I'm in eighth grade now, very aware of what's going on, and very much questioning, like, God, why would you do this to me again? Like, I've done nothing but serve you. I've done nothing but, you know, show up to your house and, and all these things. Um, and it was just kind of that hit of, like, why am I going through this again? Um, and, again, we prayed and we believed. Uh, but I had open heart surgery number two. And from that point on, for several years, I really struggled with trusting God in relationships, um, really felt the need to make it happen on my own. I found myself in situations where I was giving away areas of my purity that mm -hmm. I never intended to simply because I didn't trust that, mm -hmm. that maybe God could do what I thought I could. Um, and it really took being able to step back and realize that God has graced me for this life and that I had to, uh, you know, I said it earlier, but take the next step. I had to be a little bit gritty and I had to know that I've taken some hits in life, but God doesn't call us just to, you know, take those hits and we're done. We're out. No, we take the next step. We keep going and we know that God's given us grace for this life that we live. And, um, you know, we're not perfect and we walk through things. Veronica, you've walked through things. Um, and I know uh, sometimes we, we we see life one way, but God says, nope, I'm pulling you up. Rise up, little girl. There's more ahead of you. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that just to hear. That's real life right there. Well, Renata, I know life hasn't always been easy for you and would love to hear a, a grit and grace story that you have to share. Sure, absolutely. So my grit and grace story, um, I was in an eight-year toxic relationship, and uh, that relationship um, had me feeling lost, had me feeling broken, had me feeling insecure. You know, everything that God said, you know, I was, I wasn't in that relationship, wow. you know. So after sleepless nights, you know, crying and seeking help from therapy and and others, I finally said, you know what, I know where my help is coming from. Yeah. I need to get to the feet of Jesus. And it was at that moment where God began to speak to me and he began to tell me, hey, you need to get get away, you need to go, and you need to go far away. So um, at that point in my life, I you know, decided that I was gonna move to Washington State with my immediate family. And I, I didn't know how we were gonna get here. I didn't know, you know what route we was gonna take, but I just felt the Holy Spirit telling me to leave, and we did. We left, and it was the best decision that I could have ever made. My life has been transformed just by that one move. You know, I feel like when we listen to God and not listen to the noise around us, that's when we can really do what we need to do, and that's when God can rescue us. So my prayer for anyone that's in a tough, toxic, abusive relationship. Get out. Seek God. You will be okay. Don't worry about anything. Uh, just 
keep in mind that God will keep you, but you have to do the hard part, and that's to leave. So, um, and if you can't leave for yourself, if you got babies, leave for your baby, because I didn't have it for myself, if I'm being 100% honest. I did it for my daughter. That is the reason why I had the strength to leave. It was because I wanted better for my daughter, and we're here today in Washington State, and our life, lives have been transformed. And you see God's grace on the other side of your gritty decision. That was a step of faith, not knowing what it was going to look like, but that he's taking care of you. Ladies, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your stories and, and being vulnerable, because I think there is such a common misconception that when you follow Jesus, it's going to be easy. It's going to be sunshine and rainbows all the time. But that is furthest from the truth. When you follow Jesus, it's going to be hard and it's going to be messy. But like we've been saying, you see God's grace. You see his covering on the other side of it. And I'm so inspired when we look to scripture because there are countless examples of women in the Bible um, that that demonstrated that grit, that, that not being afraid to get in the mess of life. You know, if we look in Exodus chapter one, there were these Hebrew midwives by the name of Shua and Pua, which is fun to say alone, but they had so much courage because it was in a time where the king of Egypt had decreed a mass genocide to basically wipe out Hebrew baby boys. And they had the courage in, in, scripture, it says, because they feared God and did what was right, that they rescued these baby boys, even though culture was telling them to do one thing, they put the fear of the Lord over what culture was saying. And God honored it. He said that he not only blessed their lives, but if we continue to read through Exodus, we find this baby boy by the name of Moses and his life was spared. And God used him, if you read on, to do some pretty cool things. He led God's people, the Israelites, out of the bondage of slavery. And thank God for women like Shua and Pua who had the courage, who had the grit to do what was right, despite what culture was saying. There's other women in the Bible that can inspire us, like Abigail. Um, Abigail saved her whole household from destruction by using her calm wisdom. We also see Deborah, that she used her position to bring confidence to the troops in a war. There's another um, woman by the name of Phoebe in the New Testament. And Paul calls her a deacon and a patron of the church. And then we see another woman that Paul writes about named Lydia. And she was a founding member of a house church. God uses women. And you know, we, we look at culture today and in a way it's, it's hijacked the term womanhood and it, it's so ambiguous. It's so vague. Sometimes it can feel gray and a little, um, you hear the word socially constructed and well, what does womanhood mean to you? What is your truth? But God, but God, when we look at his word, God makes it so clear what womanhood is, what he's called us to be as women of God. You know, sometimes in, in church culture, um, we can put what a godly woman means in a bit of a box. Um, for example, if we read Proverbs 31, oh my goodness, what an amazing woman she is. But it doesn't stop there. Um, we don't, as women of God, have to be perfect and polished all the time. Um, a woman of, of God meanings, means, you know, we look at the characteristics of the women we just saw and they chose his plan over their own. I think of Mary. She was a teenage girl. She didn't know she was going to birth the Savior of the world. But she said, not my will, Lord, but your will. That's grit. That they had courage. That these women of God made sacrifices even when it risked their own lives to do what was right. That was grit. And because of their grit, God graced them to do what he had called them to do. And so our prayer is that everyone hearing this today Know that where God has positioned you, that he has called you. And if we can step out in faith and have grit, he's going to grace us to do what he's called us to do.